So let's get back to the discussion of supporting cache coherence. And uh, here's where we are now, the configuration. We are still talking about atomic uh, transaction bus, not more than one uh, at the same time. It's a write back cache with write buffers. Um, we, because of that, we already had transient state introduced. We talked a little bit about out of order processor core and what that means uh, when you have especially a relaxed uh, memory consistency model and the load store queue, the micro architecture for the processor needs to take into account the consistency and coherence request. So right now we're gonna relax this uh, constraint a little bit to introduce more real world complexity. We need to support atomic constructions. These will come in very handy later on when we have synchronization between threads. So read, modify, write. It's one transaction, uh, one instruction. It has to be done atomically. So far, we've been talking about an L1 cache hooked to a bus for the next level. We'll see that uh, in reality, obviously, we have more than one level of caches. That introduces some complexity. And then the higher performing version of the bus, split transaction bus, and that's going to uh, introduce some complexity as well. Every step that we make, uh, every performance enhancing technique that we add is going to bring some uh, complication to the, to the um, <coughs> coherent substrate. So let's look at atomic operation for a moment. This, in fact, um, is uh, something that we will talk, talk about later, like a lock. If you have two threads, they all want to access the same common data structure. And you have critical sections. One thread has to go in, make a certain amount of change to that, and we often have lock. Software structure, uh, if someone locks a particular data structure, other threads will not proceed to modify the data structure until the log is um, released. And a log is often implemented as, um, for instance, a test and set. Initially it was a zero, you see it's a zero, and then you set it to one, uh, therefore preventing other threats from obtaining the log. So we'll see that uh, later, how this is uh, actually done, uh, achieved. Um, I just want to mention here that um, supporting atomic operations, in fact, doesn't make, this is perhaps an exception, doesn't make uh, cache coherence more difficult. In fact, cache helps to make atomic operations easier. Okay. Um, why? And that's because your atomic operation, this log, test and set, it's always with respect to other writes to the same location, meaning uh, if I'm test and setting uh, a particular variable x, okay, the atomicity is really about testing to see if x is zero, and if so, setting x equal to one with regard to other attempt of modifying x. Doesn't matter uh, other attempts modifying a different variable y. And if we have um, cache, the cache line is brought in, and if we want to modify it, uh, it's brought in in an exclusive state. And so, in fact, it's easier. We have it. It's very easy to make sure that we're the only one to, to modify the state. And there are some tricks you can do by delaying, um, by delaying external snoop concerning the line. If I want to test and set cache line X, I happen to have it in exclusive state. Someone wants to invalidate to, uh, invalidate my version. Um, I can make some changes to to uh, to to delay that snooping request to reject it. So overall, this is not a big concern to us. So we'll not worry about it. Okay, we'll worry about atomic operation when we deal with uh, thread level synchronization. In modern microarchitectures, the um, atomic operations uh, are usually not implemented as a test and set or compare and swap. We'll get into all of that discussion. They're usually implemented as a pair of instruction called load linked and store conditional. 
<coughs> so um, there's some subtle issues about that. Um, at this point, we will just uh, ignore it um, and, and deal with it when we talk about thread level synchronization. So that's about it. Now, multiple cache level. This is something um, that is an, an extension and complication on the uh, single levels of cache that we've been associating uh, with. So we, we have these pictures, right? We have cores uh, connected to their L1 cache, and they're all on the same bus. What if this is your private cache hierarchy? Okay, so instead of one cache, you have more than one. You have L1 and you have L2. Um, obviously, you can think about it as simply that's your cache. This maybe this is internally uh, this is internally two separate caches, but I'm just going to treat it as the cache. And when there is a coherence request, I do both okay, independently. Um, you can do that. It's not nice. Uh, it's not good. It would be nice if we treat them uh, in a consistent way such that we uh, don't have to snoop both. And so a principle that allows you to avoid snooping both cache is the inclusion principle, which means an L1 cache, for instance, contains always a subset of the content of L2 L2 always contains the subset of L3 and so on and so forth. Okay, so why is this good? <coughs> because we can allow the lower level cache uh, to function as a filter. If I snoop L2, I don't find it in L2, and because the inclusion property, we know that it must not be in L1. That's actually good. Okay, so. Um, that makes the life easier because L1 is this cache that is really tied to the processor core. We want to optimize it so that it's fast. And L2 now serving as sort of an agent that filters out most of the requests and do not bother us as nearly as much. So that may be a good thing. Now, um, once you have uh, two levels of caches, do you necessarily have the inclusion principle? Is it always like that? In fact, no. If your different caches replace your cache lines independently, okay, then you don't necessarily have this uh, situation. Let's say, a very simple example, let's say my um, victim selection is random. I have a cache set, I randomly select the cache line, so you could uh, evict the cache line in, in L2, but the L1 doesn't really uh, evict the same cache line. So you end up with not guaranteeing uh, an inclusion property. So back then, this was a pop topic uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. I forgot exactly when. Uh, there were actually a lot of debate about how to make sure that there are uh, they're, they're guaranteed to have the inclusion property. There are certain rules that you you derive that will happen. For instance, if your L1 is direct map, your L2 uh, is a bigger cache, then, then that guarantees uh, in inclusion. Um, but uh, really, at the end of the day, it's uh, fairly simple to guarantee inclusion, which is if I'm uh, getting rid of a line in a lower level cache, I want to make sure that it's not in the higher, in, in the cache closer to the processor. Okay, so if I don't have the line in L2, I'm going to shoot it down from L1, and then therefore guaranteeing anything that is in L2 in L1 has to be um, in L2. Okay, so that simplifies uh, the job. Just do it algorithmically. Have the algorithm to make sure that that happens. So here I want to pause the video, you to pause the video and think about it. What about the load queue? Can you treat it as uh, an L0 cache? Um, and how do we maintain or should we maintain inclusion property? Think about it. Well, in a way, 
it is an L0 cache. It's not a cache as we know it, but it is um, a smaller unit that sort of captures uh, some of the, the the content that we loaded. We're not reusing it, so it's, it's not a cache per se, but it has this uh, issue, which is um, if we're snooping a cache line on L2, okay? Uh, the fact that we don't have it in L2 doesn't mean we haven't loaded it in to the load queue, okay? Because we're not maintaining this inclusion. If we maintain inclusion, then something in the load queue is guaranteed to be in L2, right? But we're not maintaining the inclusion. For, for various reasons that uh, we, we don't have to go into. So therefore, if I search my L2 and I don't find the line, it's not job done because the processor might have loaded from it and it is in load queue and we have to deal with it. This is terrible. This is why every single request coming to your bus, you have to search your load queue. You can't rely on the inclusion principle to say, well, um, my uh, L2 or L3, my last level cache is uh, snooping, filtered it out. No, you can't, because we are not maintaining inclusion uh, between load queue and other levels of caches. We could, we could choose to do that. It may be problematic, but, but uh, um, uh, conventionally this has not been done, which is why the, uh, what we were talking about, the load queue having so many searches necessary is still a pretty bad thing um, because now uh, this multi-level cache hierarchy is not going to save you. It's, it's not going to filter out anything. Okay, so um, this really isn't a whole lot of complication after this. You maintain cache inclusion, then whatever we were discussing, um, uh, perhaps a few uh, videos ago, all these logic that we have. Um, this is really all these logic, okay? Um, that simply is connected to the lower level cache, let's say L2. Okay, And if we have a hit or a certain snoop hit into the L2, then perhaps you know, to invalidate the cache line, we have to percolate this up to L1 and so on. So that's really it. Here we're drawing a single cache, um, but in reality it would be uh, the bus facing controller would be uh, primarily operating on, um, on the uh, lower level cache rather than the higher level cache. So this is um, sp uh, this is multiple cache, multi-level cache hierarchy. The next um, simplification that we have to relax is the atomic bus trans uh, atomic bus uh, assumption, and we have to deal with what's called split transaction bus, which kind of makes sense. So, what is a bus? A bus is a place where you exchange information about address and data. Um, you know, memory and and processor can be hooked up to the same bus. So one can drive the address, uh, the other will receive the address, go look into uh, its content, grab the data, drive the data bus, uh, and the, uh, the requester would latch in the data from the bus. Okay, so if you think about the memory access, I have to send address, and the memory has to go off and read, there's latency involved. And when the whole read is done, memory is going to drive the data back on the bus. <clears throat> An atomic bus would say this whole time period, the bus is locked for that transaction. So if it takes 100 nanoseconds, the bus is not usable for the entire non 100 nanoseconds for anything else. Split transaction bus recognize the use of the bus. The bus is really to communicate. Okay. You don't need the bus to access memory, right? the physical access of the memory. So you use the bus to send the request, and then that's it. Someone else can take the bus 
to send the request. And when the memory response comes back, you can grab the bus again, maybe a different bus, and use that to transfer data. So bus is for communication, not for memory access per se. Okay, so we separate the transaction into request and response, and each one would have its own arbitration. <clears throat> Here is a, a visual way of seeing this, right? So I have one uh, request, the first request, right over here. We send address and command on the uh, address bus. So this would be your uh, address bus. And this would be your, uh, sorry, here, data bus. Okay, so on the address bus, uh, as time goes by, this is x-axis is time. Okay, so the first couple of cycles, first unit, uh, we're using the bus to transfer uh, address command of the first transaction, transaction one, right? And then by the time it's done, uh, the memory is starting to making access, okay? At mean time, if it can be a little fancy, Meantime, a second transaction uses the bus. Okay, and this is uh, in parallel to the first transaction's access. So the second transaction can happen, and then, and so on and so forth. So the tr second memory transaction happens in the background there. So when the first transaction comes back, okay, when the first transaction comes back, that's when we arbitrate for the data bus and use that bus to transfer the data. Okay, so this makes so much more sense. Uh, bus would be utilized more efficiently, uh, therefore having better throughput. Um, uh, the, uh, the delay in accessing memory is not occupying the resource of the bus unnecessarily. So, good thing. Why do we care? What's the complication? Well, the complication is this. Now, new requests can come onto the bus before the previous one was serviced. So far, we've been dealing with there is one transaction on the bus. Everybody get it done, and then we move on to the next transaction. Now, there could be several balls in the air. Okay? So before the snoop result is obtained, someone else is accessing something else. So we got to take that into account. And you, if you don't, you have conflict. Okay. So maybe one transaction says, "Oh, I want to write to X." Next transaction comes at the same time, says, "I want to write to X." You can't allow that to happen. You know, only one uh, one node can have uh, X in in modified state at any time. Okay. So this is one situation. So, uh, and because you have these multiple transactions uh, pending at the same time, these multiple transactions, T1, T2, maybe T3, another transaction, you have all these transactions. Every time you have a transaction, you have metadata. You have to know who, who e initiated it, what's the address, you have, you need buffers. You need buffer entries to keep track of those, okay? And these buffers, any time you have buffer, you have a flow control problem. What if you overflow it? How do you make sure that uh, no more uh, transaction is coming in? Okay, so now go back and think about your single uh, uh, atomic bus structure. Okay, maybe um, take out your notes from before that when you were figuring out what's happening. Now think about what's going to happen when our snoop results provided? When our data response provided? Do we really need the data response to match the order to request? Um, should we send a snoop and data response together or separately? What do you think? How would you design it? If, you, if I have multiple transactions, how would the, the system uh, work? Pause the video, think about it. Okay? Um, use the uh, use uh, the plot maybe we had before. I don't know why this is, this doesn't allow me to go um, to a particular slide uh, on my iPad. Use this. Think about it. Right. Right now we have one system. Draw another copy of this. This is one node. All of this is from one processor. Draw three of them, and imagine one can send a request. Another 
uh, can also send a request and think about that. Again, pause the video. Uh, this is uh, a good exercise. <clears throat> so, um, really, once we have this, there is sort of a notion of a snooping-based coherence versus a, a more general-purpose interconnect. As we will see, even though we have what is called a bus, it's no longer this atomic thing. It, the interface is basically becoming a general-purpose interconnect. So later on, when we s snatch away the bus, put in just a network, uh, it will work. We've already dealt with much of the problem. So um, this, we're going to use an example. This is a very old example. A company doesn't even exist. Um, <clears throat> but uh, this is all documented in textbook, so we know it's true. Uh, other companies have newer products you know, on chip. They did something similar, but um, the detail um, are different. So here's how they did it. Okay. So even though they allow multiple requests, outstanding, eight, they said no conflicting requests to the same block. So that's, that's sensible. I don't want to happen, I, I don't want to handle two processors making the same request to cache line X uh, while, uh, you know, uh, uh, at the same time. I want X to happen at the same time when with a transaction uh, about cache line Y, but not two transactions about X. And we'll see how that's done. Uh, it's not difficult. And this is where we introduce a very common concept. Later on, we'll, we'll see that a, a lot. And that's uh, called a NAC, negative acknowledgement. Okay, It's a flow control mechanism. If I can't handle more, let's say I have uh, eight transaction uh, already in my system um, and uh, someone wants to issue a new one you, you can't do that uh, or if you want me to do something uh, let's say you want um, me to write back the result I cannot do it because everything I've already exhausted all eight outstanding requests I cannot do it I'll knack you okay so there will be um, <clears throat> a command line, a command bus uh, with address and data bus. There will be these separate buses. Okay, and the command may include a NAC uh, signal to to propagate this information. So we'll see that a detail about that, and we will see that the answer to one of the questions that we pose, our response, um, our response supposed to be in order. In the, in the same order of requests? And the answer is no, we, we don't need that. Um, but to be able to do that, we have therefore to, uh, to give them an ID. So when the response comes back, we know which request it's serving, but it doesn't have to be in the original order. And that makes sense. If you have an access to a nearby memory, it will take much shorter than if it's uh, an access to a, a far uh, more remote location. <coughs> So next we're going to look at this, how this works, um, how they did it. Um, and they have different buses, different buses have bus cycles and, um, and transaction cycles. Okay, so uh, we'll follow this through. So this is the timing diagram of the bus. Um, you have uh, address bus, you have data bus. Okay. And uh, they are arbitrated differently. Data bus arbitration is separate. Address bus uh, arbitration is part of the um, request cycle. So they're all done differently. Uh, this is time. X-axis is time. Every, every one of these is a, is a cycle, okay? But it's a bus cycle, okay? Which is, un, uh, which is not necessarily the same. Usually not the same. Usually much slower than the clock cycle of the processor. So your processor may be, I don't know, one gigahertz, but your uh, bus may be half a gigahertz or even slower. So this is possible. And this is uh, the uh, the machine that we're talking about back in the days, this may be in the megahertz domain, but it really doesn't matter. The idea is exactly the same. 
So a bus transaction uh, takes five such bus cycles. You can see the, the darker line over here. So this is a bus transaction. So the time is aligned. Um, every five cycle a transaction happens. So we're uh, looking at two examples. Right now the first transaction is happening. This is a bus cycle, uh, but transaction cycle, I should say, five cycles. On the first cycle, everybody poses a request. So you say, oh, I have something I want to put on the address bus. This is an address bus. Everybody expresses their uh, desire to obtain the bus. After some delay, the arbiter would say, you, note number two, you get a bus. From now on to the rest, to the rest of this uh, transaction cycle, it's your bus. So the node uh, that got the request would then start to drive the address onto the bus in the third cycle and wait for some sort of acknowledgement by the receiver to say, okay, we got it, move on. So the next cycle starts. This is the darker color. The second transaction happens exactly the same way uh, over the next five cycles. Okay. Um, so for data bus, something is done slightly differently. It's still a five cycle, um, five cycle transaction time, and it's shown here. But because we need data is, usually we need a lot of throughput. You send the entire cache line. So the first, uh, the first cycle, you send a quarter of the cache line. That may be 16 bytes. So that's 128 bit. You have a lot of bus lines. So 128 bit in the first cycle, another 128 in the second cycle, so on and so forth. So to arbitrate for the bus, we use something separate, and this is the data arbitration. So that's also in five cycle, uh, five cycle period. <clears throat> it's rather simple. At the beginning of that uh, arbitration cycle, everybody sends a data bus arbitration request to say, I need the data bus, and then the arbiter would decide who gets it, uh, send back to say, okay, you get it, so there's a delay. So you get it four cycles later, on that data bus over there, you can drive the data. Okay, so that's, uh, we're looking at two transactions, how they pipeline uh, over these buses. Okay, um, so the address bus is really the more interesting part. This is where things get figured out. Uh, after the address phase, we know a lot. We know who's providing the data. Okay, we know uh, if it is a read, there is a requester. Um, we know whether you get the data from from memory or you get the data from uh, another node from another. Uh, cache, and if it's uh, reading from memory, whether it's shared or exclusive, um, if someone else needs to intervene and therefore downgrade from from dirty data or mollified state to shared state, if it's a write transaction, at the end of this we know what it is, at the end of the address and command we know that it's a write transaction, everybody else needs to invalidate. So uh, this is all becoming clear. Okay, they have two separate buses, arbitrated independently. One for address and requests. Really, it has address. It has the type of uh, it has the type of uh, memory request there. The other is for response, <coughs> and that's the data bus. As, you, as we already saw, okay, the, the data bus is for um, just supplying data. Uh, if you have a write back, then it's a slightly different thing. You have to make an arbitration for both bus at the same time because you put the data onto the data bus and you put the address on the address bus so the memory uh, controller can take both, put it in into the memory. Okay, so write back is slightly different. Um, <clears throat> the data bus, again, 
is arbitrated uh, in this uh, pipeline fashion. You arbitrate here, right? Everybody says they want it. And then later on you get it. But for the address bus, for simplicity, it's done in that transaction cycle. So we allow eight outstanding requests. And what we do is we give each request a three bit tag. So next time when the data comes back, instead of saying this is the data for address X, which is again, a, you know, a, let's say 64 bit value to specify that this is address, we only need to show the tag. Oh, this is data for transaction four. And then whoever issued transaction four knows what the address of transaction four is. So that's all we need, three bit of tag. And that allows uh, eight uh, outstanding transactions. <clears throat> so now that this is how the bus works, it's a split transaction bus, let's look at the system, the, um, uh, the cash controller side. Okay, This is what we started with. This is a couple of um, you know, slides ago. We have the cache data, uh, the two copies of the tag, one serving the processor side controller, one serving the bus side controller. And we're going to use the address uh, latched from the data, uh, from, from the bus, to compare, OK, to compare to uh, either data in the cache array or in the write back buffer. <clears throat> okay, this is the same thing that we saw early on. So now this is supporting just one transaction at a time, and we need a more uh, data structure to make it supply, uh, uh, manage more than one. And this is the data structure that we just added in. Maybe I should clear this thing so it doesn't look confusing. <clears throat> okay, so the major thing that's added in here is the highlighted box. Okay. It's a table. We remember what's happening, all right? Because there are eight possible outstanding. That's where you see from zero to seven over here. Each request table entry uh, has the following field. There's a tag, the three-bit tag, what address, who originated uh, the request, which node, uh, what my response, this is for the particular node, let's say uh, node 3 issued this request, my response was something, so I, I said no, I don't have the data, for instance, and whatever other MISC information. So this table is everywhere, okay, this, this whole thing is obviously one node, and you can imagine this is node number one, let's say, and you would have node number three somewhere else on the same bus. The bus goes on, node number two is sitting on the same bus, and so on. So this table, therefore, exists in all of these nodes, okay? And they, they contain pretty much uh, the same information, and therefore, it's very easy to disallow conflicting requests. Why? If I have a request about address X, I simply look into this table. If there is already a request about address X, I would say, okay, then I'm not allowed to issue that request. I cannot go on to the address bus to uh, request uh, the bus. So the controller will simply not do that. Okay, this is... Uh, uh, <coughs> This is how it works. So now let's think about it. Because there are eight pending transactions, let me ask you a question. Think about this. Pause the video. Uh, OK. How many write back buffers do we need if we allow eight, maximum eight, outstanding transactions? What is the answer? Well, the answer is clear. It, we probably need eight to handle worst-case scenario. Okay, the, the, these might be 
So there might be eight pending transactions to ask for address x1, x2, all the way to x8. Um, and they are all dirty in my cache line, in my cache. So I would have to put them into the right buffer and wait until my turn to get, um, to get the bus. Okay, but how many do you really want to provide? Do you really want to provide all eight? to handle all the worst case situation. You know? um, if you have experience design, uh, designing system, you would say, I would provide what is sensible. Um, I, I would provide however many that is um, perhaps most commonly needed. You know, 85% of the time, there's only one uh, that I need. Okay, I'll provide two and I cover uh, more than 85% of the cases and I don't have to uh, drag a gigantic system or a gigantic queue for something that almost never happens in the real world. This happens all the time, right? Okay, so now you have the possibility of a worst case situation where you don't have enough right back buffer. Now what do you do? What if that right back buffer is full and someone else wants you to write back? What would you do? Think about it. If you remember the thing that we said early on, that's where flow control comes in. Okay? So both buses have this thing called a NAC line. And if you remember the thing we drew a couple of slides ago, um, we have wired or thing. So this is very easy. So it's a NAC line. You charge it. Anybody who wants to NAC would discharge it and then indicating, okay, I, I can't handle this, and you don't care who says that, whoever knacks it, the transaction is aborted, okay? So if you, let's say, want to read, you put your address on the bus, everybody who got the chance looked at it, someone has an objection for whatever reason, would simply assert uh, the knack line, say, it can't happen, I, I need some time. And uh, for instance, if, if the right back buffer is full, and then the NAC uh, would be uh, enforced and you simply say, okay, so my transaction failed. It didn't happen. Um, I go back, uh, delay for a little while, come back, try again. <clears throat> so the retry style is an independent problem and we'll just ignore it. You, you can do all kinds of retry. You can periodically retry this. Perhaps you need some back off, meaning if you tried it three cycles ago, it didn't work. You try uh, again in five cycles, it didn't work. Well, then the next time, maybe you should wait for 20 cycles or some long, longer amount of time. Perhaps the thing that you're waiting for uh, hasn't happened yet. And if you keep on trying, you would just be wasting the bandwidth of the bus that could be um, uh, productively used for other transactions. So maybe every time you fail, you double the wait latency. You could also uh, be smart about it and say, why, why don't we do this? Whoever was going to, uh, whoever knacked your request knows when he's ready to handle your request. Why don't you, why don't you allow that? node to tell you when to reinitialize the request okay it's not easy to support you can do that so that's uh, that's a policy issue what you want to do okay but here all we wanted to to uh, understand is that there are cases once we have all these complexity there are cases where we can't handle a transaction and the simple thing to do is to knock it so that's about it with this we have something that is fairly um, fairly robust. It can handle multiple transactions. You can even have flow control. You can reject something, retry later, and it will sort of start to work, okay? And uh, the this is something that we're going to use. Um, this is uh, the, the, the general microarchitecture of the coherent substrate, at least the controller side of things, it's going to look like this, okay? And from there on, we can start to build 
um, perhaps more complex systems, one of the things to think about is scaling. So what's the problem with a bus? Problem with a bus is scalability limit. Okay, I have a bus and I have multiple nodes hooked to the bus. Let's say each bus, each node has certain um, bandwidth requests, uh, one gigabyte per second. Now, if you combine n nodes, it's going to be a larger number. And depending on how you design your bus, and that may be the bottleneck. So after putting a couple of nodes on your bus, you find you cannot support uh, that, many, uh, that many processors. They all, they all queue up. Um, everybody slow down because of the bottleneck of the bus. So scaling becomes a problem. Uh, we want multiple processor, but we want the ability to build perhaps a large number of multiple uh, of processors. So there are some uh, scaling. Perhaps these examples here are for moderate scaling, not really scale it to a large extent. Perhaps we should use a ring. Okay, which is really just um, segmented. Uh, segmented bus if you wish it's no longer a bus i have a segment connecting between node i and i plus one uh, i plus one and i plus two so on and so forth and uh, they form a ring eventually so why is this good well then the the thing that is good is at any moment we're only using one segment <coughs> of the interconnect we're sending a packet from here to there okay other segments are free to be used by other requests so if we add more processors at the same time we're adding more segments to it so it allows um, the bandwidth to scale up uh, with with the number of processors. so that's better well then how do we know the snoop request has reached everybody when in that case the snoop request is to make a round the whole cycle the whole circle the ring uh, reaching the sender for you to know oh everybody has seen the request and now you introduce all kinds of problems you have race what if two nodes simultaneously injected some message to their segment of the ring to say please invalidate x now you have to worry about situations like that, okay? And once you have a ring, you have an access control problem. In bus, you have a global arbiter. We know how to do that. If you have a ring, different segments, how do you do that? So there's all kinds of idea. Token passing, for instance, there is a token. Whoever can inject um, has to obtain the token before it can inject. Uh, but then there's a little bit of a bait, uh, a little bit of a waste. Um, of of the bandwidth, so this goes on. There's some some early stage designers, some ideas about how to scale uh, the system a little bit. Um, we're not going to worry about this. We're just going to uh, assume that um, you build a bus based, or you build something more generic that is very scalable. All these kind of uh, half measures are not necessarily. Uh, more simple than uh, we, we have a big system okay so from now on the next video we're going to talk about uh, a scalable system where we don't have a bus we have a general purpose interconnect and that will obviously make the uh, coherent substrate even more complex and every time we introduce something it makes it more complex but we're in good shape this it is uh, pretty good already it's built it serves as a foundation for for the next